People who had a traumatic childhood can be very difficult to be in a relationship or marriage with. I get a lot of letters from hurt, scared people who are going through a lot of pain because their partner has CPTSD and is not yet able to calm their symptoms. Now, do I think people with CPTSD are always worth being with? No, not always. But great relationships are possible when you both understand what CPTSD is and you're both working on strategies to halt the hurtful and chaotic dynamics that can very easily pull couples into a dark vortex. With knowledge and goodwill, healing can be totally positive for both people. And can I just say this to the people who do choose to love people with CPTSD? I love you for this. I'm grateful to those of you who care enough to ask how to be a good partner to those of us who are affected by hard stuff in childhood. A loving and stable relationship goes a long way to help heal human beings who are hurt and feeling alone. So thank you for that. All right. I first just want to acknowledge that the symptoms of childhood PTSD are on a continuum. They come and go. They might be little things and they could be very serious things. And before I get into the nuts and bolts of how to be with someone who's having these symptoms, I just want to say, under no circumstances should you put up with abuse. And I'll get into that a little more at the end. But yes, people who had a hard childhood are totally worthy and lovable and can be worth a bit of trouble sometimes. And yes, we can be complicated and confusing and needy and exasperated sometimes, but also wise and capable and warm. So here are some tips to help you understand your loved one and offer support while also taking care of yourself because there is no good relationship where people don't take care of themselves. So first of all, it may be helpful to know that a lot of what your partner's dealing with is called dysregulation. This is a real and measurable nervous system phenomena that can cause a person to feel, you know, spaced out, discombobulated, emotionally overreactive, you've probably seen that, and struggling to think straight. And <laughs> you're like, uh-huh. Dysregulation happens to everybody to some degree sometimes, and we all naturally recover from it eventually. And this is, this recovered state is called re-regulation or self-regulation. Now, self-regulation is often used in the context of emotional dysregulation, which is one piece of the pie, emotional. But nervous system dysregulation is not just emotions. It's the endocrine system. It's the immune system. It's blood flow. It's the vital signs. There's a lot of things that are really not under a person's control directly, but they can be calmed using techniques. So, the recovered state, it's called re-regulation. And the thing about, for people who have PTSD from childhood, it, getting dysregulated can happen a lot more frequently. It can be a lot harder to climb back out of. And so a person who had trauma compared to somebody who doesn't, the traumatized person is probably spending more time dysregulated and having a harder time climbing back out of it. And it's during those dysregulated times that the problems can really get in. Now, it's important to remember the tendency to get dysregulated is not your partner's fault and it isn't your fault, even if your partner thinks it's your fault when they're upset. Now, everybody does that sometimes, right? We blame other people, but the symptoms you're seeing are just what PTSD looks like when it's not very well under control. And technically, how you deal with your partner's dysregulation could influence how quickly they can get re-regulated. If you just start yelling or threatening to leave, you're not likely to calm things down. So unless you mean it, unless that's really what you want, I'd recommend don't make threats. Don't do things that increase the drama. It, it just doesn't help. You don't have to be a doormat either. So it's important for you to remember, even if your partner can't see it in the moment, that it's not your fault that their feelings got this intense and you're not responsible for making it better right now. It's not your fault and it's not your job. It's the person who has PTSD. It's our job. We've got to learn to re-regulate. We have to. Nobody can regulate our PTSD brains for us. We're the ones who've got to take steps to change it. And we're the ones who have the option of self-control. We also have the option to leave if somebody is just so, you know, destructive to us that we cannot self-regulate. That's where people get into like a no contact relationship with an ex or perhaps a family member. So as hard as it may be 
to draw upon when you're feeling the urge to lash out or run away from loved ones. The inner resources are there to calm your symptoms. It's not the fault of the person with CPTSD, but we are the ones who can make the change in here. Okay, that said, here's what you can do. You can support your partner as they try to heal, as they learn to re-regulate. You can ask or suggest that they try to heal. You can um, suggest they read a certain book or try a certain technique, but you cannot make it happen. Not on your timeline, not against their will, and you can't do it for them. If only you could, right? I get a lot of uh, mails and comments from people who are like, how do I make someone heal? And you can't, but you can offer support and you can suggest things lightly, but you must remember what is needed is understanding, encouragement, and then being willing to step back and detach a little uh, to allow people to make their own decisions and find their own answers. It's genuinely the truth that no one person really knows what another person needs. And uh, I, I, I sit here and I teach about this stuff every day of my life, but I never presume to know what another person needs. And so when you do that to a partner, you know what happens. They don't like it. They will pull away. They will shut down. It could delay things for them. And you might notice that when your partner is dysregulated, they can go from happy and goofy to overwhelmed and enraged, and then to emotional flatness, like nothing ever happened, all without you ever realizing what set this off. And sometimes they'll be dysregulated without any outward signs. They seem fine, they say they're fine, but then you notice they're not hearing a word you say, or they're tripping over things, or forgetting to show up for appointments. With some people, this brain fog aspect of dysregulation can be really pervasive. And it'll be tempting for you to think they're acting this way intentionally to show you that you're not important to them or they don't respect you. Or you might try to force them to go see an ADHD specialist and take medication. But hold on, because while all of this could be the case, it's most likely just a sign that they're dysregulated. And believe me, I'm telling people like your partner that dysregulation is not an excuse to be rude or inconsiderate. Healing while you're in a couple means two people meeting halfway and your partner may need to make the effort to show you that they care. And you need to keep in mind that a brain thing might be temporarily blocking the signs of caring that you need to see. Like the, the emotion is there, but you can't see it on the face. So that's one thing. But maybe the hardest thing about a person with childhood PTSD is that they can be unreasonable. They get upset and you get blamed for things that you have nothing to do with. And I'll tell you a secret. If you keep presenting yourself as someone who has power to fix the PTSD, who has the answers, you will soon be having fights about why you haven't fixed it yet. And I'm going to bet you've had that argument before, maybe many times where your partner believes that you have the key because you sort of presented yourself that way, for them feeling better if only you would turn the key. But you won't because you're so mean, right? That's a way of thinking that I call outsourcing responsibility for healing. And I tell people with childhood PTSD to step out of that thinking and own the process. You know, I know like we're all at the effect of other people. Other people affect us very much, of course, but we must own the process of our healing and changing how we behave. And I'm telling you, as their partner, let them own it. It's totally okay and appropriate to offer comfort to a person who's in a PTSD response and consistent love and stability are good things and definitely influence healing. But sometimes what love looks like if you support a person and give them space to just, you know, day by day, notice how their, how their PTSD symptoms affect them and let them recalibrate their response. That's what healing can look like. Maybe they're already in my courses for doing this. And that's how you heard about me. You can support your partner while they do the work and still hold a boundary against yucky behavior or abusive behavior that happens when they're dysregulated. So the way to do that is when you notice the symptoms coming on in your partner and they're starting to behave in ways that are making you feel scared or upset, you can take a step back. Your feelings matter. They matter a lot. You, you are half of this. But your partner who's having CPTSD symptoms right now, this is not a good time to try to talk things out with them or get what you need. You'll get much better results if you wait. And if they're pressing you to talk about their feelings, and we do that sometimes, <laughs> then say, things are feeling a little intense right now and I want to talk to you, but I want to wait until things are calmer. 
Now notice you're not abandoning them. That's a trigger you don't want to set off unintentionally. You're not shutting them down. You're making a plan to communicate in a better way. And if your partner doesn't want to let you do that, you get to do it anyway. Now remember, they're not, they're not themselves right now. So it's for you to do the wise thing for yourself. And remember, they will eventually feel calmer and you can talk then. So what's helped me in my marriage, since I'm the one who gets dysregulated, is that I try to take responsibility to notice when I'm dysregulated, not say much until I can get, get myself re-regulated. And this is sometimes easier said than done. And the urge to, you know, process the feelings sometimes is overpowering. Now, by process, I mean like talk, 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 you know, and you said this and you said that and blah, blah, blah. and even when I mask it as I statements, you know, I felt, I felt horrible because you were just such a dick, <laughs> you know, doesn't, <laughs> dysregulated talk, it's like drunk talk. Think of it that way, you know, the, I, I even tell people when you're dysregulated, do not drive a car, pull over. If you can't remember, you know, if you're having like blankouts about how you got across the bridge, stop, stop and re-regulate. And that's what I teach. I teach tools to re-regulate quickly and then also long-term strategies to stay regulated more of the time. But you don't try to have a big major conversation about what's happening or to try to break down some horrible argument that you had while a person is dysregulated. If you really want to have communication Maintaining regulation is everything. It's everything. And so the person with CPTSD, that's the first order of business is to learn how to do that, how to go slowly enough and gently enough that they can kind of stay lucid and in their body enough to talk about how they're feeling and not have this big like um, emotional flashback come and take over believing, you know, you're just the worst thing. And you, <laughs> you've probably been in that position, you know, where they're just like blowing flame at you. And it's destructive for people with CPTSD to get into that blame place because so long as we are blaming other people for how we feel, we can't recover. It's, it, you know, you're just trying to like, get, it's like, help me, fix me, fix me. Well, other people cannot. It explains so much once you understand that it's like, oh, they can't. You know, there's things that other people can do to support you. But until a person with CPTSD realizes what an inside job this is to self-regulate, there's going to be so much conflict with partners, so much conflict. So that little codependent dynamic of like, I'm going to help you, honey, I'm going to help you. It can be too much, but support is real. There is a way to support. And it's just like to, to do your part to keep it from going down that road of yelling, fixing, uh, blaming. All right. So you're using restraint on that side. The person with CPTSD is, is working on restraint as well and using tools because ultimately none of us has a license to take out our frustrations on other people. And not even because some of us had bad things happen when we were small that affected us neurologically. It's not a license. It may be an explanation, but it's not an excuse. So here's a summary of things that you can do when your partner is experiencing symptoms. First, you can notice the dysregulation. Sometimes even if you don't say anything, just noting it to yourself, oh gosh, they're dysregulated again. And this can help you stay neutral and even supportive without getting sucked into the drama. Second, you can try to reduce overwhelm for your partner by slowing down, keeping your voice gentle, and not asking a lot of questions or making demands. And again, you don't have to mention that you're doing this. You can just do it and see if it helps. The third thing you can do is mention what you're noticing and ask what they need. You can say, hey, I noticed this is making you a bit overwhelmed. Is there anything you need to make this easier? Or you could say, would it help if I gave you a hug right now? Because squeezing hugs can be really helpful, but you want to make sure it's wanted and expected. Uh, for a lot of people, uh, you know, a hug, especially out of the blue, it can just, it can set off more, dis you know, it just triggers something. And so you don't want to set off more dysregulation because um, it can feel constricting, it can feel threatening, it can feel controlling. Um, but at the right time, a squeezing hug can be so comforting to the nervous system. So timing. Uh, then if things start getting tense, it can be, it can, it can help if you get a little space or a tiny bit of separation. And the trick is to do this without setting off an abandonment trigger. So let's say you're on the phone and you can hear your partner getting wound up. It's about to turn into an argument. You can say, I need five minutes apart and make a concrete plan for when you're going to call them back. And that just five minute break can allow both of you to discharge the dysregulation and the anger that was bubbling up. 
If your partner uses my daily practice techniques of writing and meditating, yes, you can very politely, very politely, gently suggest, not demand, that they might want to do that. Or you can do it. You can do the daily practice. It's for everyone. And you can invite them to do it with you. But since any kind of comment about dysregulation can, well, you know, nobody wants to be told what to do. But when you're in a, when a person is in a state of dysregulation, getting called out on it is, uh, it can feel like criticism. Sometimes the kindest thing is to tell a white lie and pretend that you have to go to the bathroom just to get a few minutes apart. Whatever you do, don't resort to giving the silent treatment or storming out or threatening the relationship. Even if you know that you're actually going to leave, which you probably aren't, but even if you are, if that's what you know, announcing it to a dysregulated person is only going to lead to a blow up. So my advice is stay polite, stay kind, stay out of the drama, let the storm pass. Your partner might complain and try to get the conversation started again. But believe me, they will thank you later when their brain and emotions are re-regulated that you stayed calm and sturdy and didn't let things turn into a big fight. Well, I, people don't always thank you later, but they would if they could see the big picture of the fight that was just averted. Everyone is exhausted after a fight and arguing can cost a person with childhood PTSD days of dysregulation where they're only quasi-functioning. It can cause people to, you know, forego great opportunities. It can cause them to abandon things that are totally worthwhile. So calm is good. Steadiness is good. Now I mentioned at the beginning that there is no scenario where you are obliged to put up with abuse. Uh, neither at the doormat level or all out abuse, not emotional, not physical. So I don't care if you're a man or a woman. I don't care who started the argument. You don't deserve abuse. And if it happens, the right thing to do is to remove yourself with kids, if there are kids, and get to safety. Anything that needs to be worked out can be worked out when things are calmer. And that would be the time to pursue professional help for both of you, for yourself. But for you, if your partner can't or won't control abusive behavior, then it's very sad, but it's not best for you or your kids to be trapped like that. Okay, all that said, if you are blessed enough to have a safe, loving, and supportive relationship, that is just one of the most wonderful healing things that could happen for anyone. And it's a great gift for a person who had trauma as a kid. Not everybody is called to that kind of relationship, and some people are not healed enough yet to pull it off right now. But a good relationship is worth really putting your heart into. It's a good reason to work hard on yourself as a person. If you're a single person with CPTSD who longs for a relationship, keep working on your symptoms. You, you can become ready for a closer, more safe and stable relationship that's fulfilling for you. If you're with the person with CPTSD, there is hope so long as someone will cooperate with you to start calming the symptoms. So again, my love and appreciation to all of the partners out there who have given that to us and who make the world a loving place for us because of it. 